welcome. Let's begin by acknowledging our presence this evening on the traditional lands of the Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral lands of the Mi'kmaq Nation. After the famous earthquake in San Francisco in 1865, Mark Twain wrote that the workings of the human mind were accelerated by the earthquake. And indeed, it would seem much of our thinking about disasters seems to come after they've already hit. I'm Chris Stover, the Executive Director of the Canadian Centre for Ethics in Public Affairs, which is co-founded by the Atlantic School of Theology and St. Mary's University. And for those of you who are new to SACEPA, it's an organization dedicated to initiating and stimulating conversations about the <coughs> ethical dimensions of issues in our everyday lives. Thank you to all of you for coming here tonight, and for those of you in our live stream audience. It's with gratitude to the McKechnie Institute for Public Policy and Governance and its director, Dr. Kevin Quigley, whose tenacity and perseverance provides us with the opportunity to hear Dr. Sherry Fink tonight here in Halifax. And it's a timely discussion for us to have with the 100th anniversary of the Halifax explosion taking place next Tuesday. I'm now going to turn things over to Dr. Kevin Quigley but just a little bit about Kevin before that. He specializes in public sector risk and crisis management, and he's just recently published a new book with McGill Queen's University Press called Too Critical to Fail, How Canada Manages Threats to Critical Infrastructure. I'm having a chance to right there. Okay. Uh, thanks, Chris. Um, it, I have to say it's been uh, great pleasure to work with SACEPA on organizing this event uh, tonight. SACEPA has got a lot of great experience in bringing excellent speakers to the city and uh, we were pleased to partner with them and as Chris mentioned it's a great time to talk about emergency management issues uh, not during an emergency or just after an emergency but actually to take the opportunity because of the September and Halifax explosion to reflect on some important emergency management issues. So we thought we would take this opportunity to reflect on some of these important issues and Sherry Fink is just one of the people that's working in cutting edge capacity, helping us to think about some of the big questions around emergencies and how to respond to them. So we're really delighted that, uh, that Dr. Fink is here tonight. Our keynote speaker will speak for approximately 45 minutes. 30 minutes of a question and answer period will follow, and we'll take questions from people in the audience. We'll also take questions from people online. Dr. Sherry Fink is a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist and staff reporter for the New York Times. She received the Pulitzer Prize for investigative reporting after her 2010 article, The Deadly Choices at Memorial, about the ethical challenges for doctors at Memorial Hospital during Hurricane Katrina. On the topic of Hurricane Katrina, she's also the author of the award winning book, Five Days of Memorial, Life and Death in a Storm Ravaged Hospital, published in 2013 by Crown Publishers. Dr. Fink was a member of the New York Times reporting team covering the West Africa Ebola crisis that won the 2015 Pulitzer Prize for international reporting. Most recently, Dr. Fink has been in Puerto Rico reporting the aftermath of Hurricane Maria. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Sherry Fink. Thank you. Hi everybody, it's really an honor to join you today and I think um, that point was very well made about the importance, the cruciality of thinking about disasters before they happen and not after as so often is the case. And so with that, it's, it's a delight to be here tonight. And I really do want to start out by relating what you're about to hear and what we're about to discuss to the events that happened right here 100 years ago. I was reading a brand new book on the Halifax explosion that just came out. And uh, a couple of things really stuck out to me. And I think if we don't learn from our history, we, we've we are condemned to repeat it, as it's often said, but um, there are a lot of echoes throughout history, and I've come to learn that that particular incident had a lot to do with how we think about emergency response today, but you can see some very common themes that we see in emergencies today um, going back through history to that event. And one quote stuck out to me, which was a quote that 
was from a cable that the Massachusetts governor sent to Halifax after hearing about the emergency. Uh, the, the Massachusetts governor, as I'm sure you know, put together a medical convoy, a, a, a few train cars with lots of medical supplies and medical personnel. And then he cabled to see if it was needed. And he cabled again, and there was no answer. And at one point he wrote, realizing time is of the utmost importance, we have not waited for your answer, but have dispatched the train. And I think that nowadays we're so used to being in constant communication, having our cell phones, being able to get answers. And when we suddenly lose that, as we see certainly in places like Puerto Rico, where the power grid was so damaged that more than two months later, uh, half of the people approximately, I believe, still don't have power. And many people still don't have cell phones, working cell phones. So just think about if we waited until we were able to be in touch and didn't sort of move forward with the type of response that can be life-saving in those early moments, what kind of a position would we be in? So I, I think that that is a really important reminder to all of us that in an emergency, we, na we need to think on our feet and we need to prepare so that we have a sense of what will be needed in a crisis because we can't always have that perfect information. A few other themes that really stuck out to me was um, had to do with improvisation, and we'll talk a lot about that tonight, that no matter how much you prepare, what you find in the moment is always going to be different than what you expect. Uh, we are always thrown surprises in emergencies, just as in everyday life. So improvisation is a very important skill to be able to cul cultivate and promote in a situation like that. So a hundred years ago, it had to do with people practicing outside the scope of your practice. You might have heard about veterinarians who were recruited to do surgeries and students, medical students, who weren't quite qualified yet. And obviously, you, you know, we want to protect people from unqualified folks, uh, you know, doing surgeries and whatnot. But on the other hand, and we can see this is a, an image from the recent shootings in Las Vegas, that public participation and people who aren't completely trained as physicians physicians can provide really important first aid in the moments of a crisis when somebody is bleeding, when you have what emergency responders in the medical field call the golden hour or the golden minutes stopping bleeding. It's life and death, and we can all take courses now in how to do that. So uh, these are very important concepts that were recognized back then, that sometimes you're going to be doing things in an emergency because any of us, you, me, we become the de facto first responder if we are in the midst of a crisis and waiting for the official responders to come in isn't always practical um, and can miss those golden minutes to save lives. And then the other concept that seemed really important 100 years ago was the concept of triage. And this is going to come up a lot tonight because we're talking about the ethics of evacuation and emergency response. And in, in this case, when you have a crisis and it hits uh, you know, a hospital, uh, a medical facility, uh, EMS, there's always this question of what happens when the typical patient load or the, the number of people who need help exceeds what the system is used to being able to provide for. And in that case, who goes first, who goes last, these become critical questions. And indeed, um, there were scenes that were written about 100 years ago about how to triage or ration the limited tetanus shots. And they decided to give them to folks who they thought had the deepest wounds and the most need. And that is one concept of triage. Um, there were also stories about patients who insisted that others with more serious needs be treated before them. And you actually do see that. I heard many stories when I interviewed folks who responded to the Las Vegas shootings of that very same principle of patients lined up in, you know, 200 patients arriving at once into a hospital and actually having the presence of mind, even in the midst of their own injuries, to say, that person over there seems to be really in trouble, go serve them first. And so uh, these sort of themes echo through history, and I think it's really important to, to um, think about them and be prepared for them.
So because we're going to be talking about some very serious subjects tonight, I thought I would start out with a little bit of um, lightheartedness. And as you probably know, because uh, some of you watch American late night shows, we have one called The Daily Show. And we have a comedian named John Stewart who was uh, the host of that for a long time. And he had some thoughts, and we, we did a little interview, and he had some thoughts about disaster preparedness for hospitals. So here's a little excerpt from his thoughts on that subject. If I have one thing to tell people about this, it's be prepared for everything to fail in a disaster. And that's why the book looks a lot at like individual decisions, what happens when everything fails, because preparedness response is all about infrastructure, organizations, and individuals. And this is really like, how can we be more prepared? So. Well, here you would think like you could you could look at this and think, oh, New Orleans, it's so chaotic down there. And of course, they're not prepared. The exact same thing, like no generators or, or all located below sea level, happened in New York City during Hurricane Sandy down at NYU. What have we learned? Are your jet? You're in a flood zone. Are the generators in the basement? Yes. <laughs> That's where we keep our generators. Well, <laughs> so like, you come in there and you're like, I'm having a heart attack. Where are your generators? Like, in the basement. You're like, all right. <laughs> all right, well, what's the weather going to be for the next two days? <laughs> oh, well, I was wondering how he was going to make that subject funny, but he somehow <laughs> figured it out. <laughs> But I think that there is a serious message there, which is that we can often, when we think about these questions of preparedness and these really dire situations where we need to evacuate a medical institution, um, we can feel kind of powerless when the infrastructure around us isn't ideally prepared. And if there's one thing I would like for everybody to come out with today is the idea again, that individuals can make a huge difference and that your preparedness can make a huge difference. And um, so let's keep that in mind as we go through some examples here. So uh, this is a picture of the Hollywood Hills nursing home after the uh, terrible Hurricane Irma that hit Florida a few weeks ago. And um, it, it's just a reminder, again, that some of the themes that we're going to talk about tonight that have to do with preparedness and Hurricane Katrina, where we'll spend the most time, is a very, very extreme example. But what we find is that the kinds of concepts and the kinds of dilemmas that, uh, that were faced there happen again and again in different disasters. And this is a particular nursing home where that question about evacuation and the ethics of evacuation really became an important point. So um, the storm was coming, the state knew that it was going to be very severe. How do you decide whether or not to evacuate a place like a nursing home where you've got a couple of different things to balance? Uh, it's always, always going to be a stress when you move older people who are used to their surroundings, when you move people who are sick. On the other hand, if you don't move them and you know that you have critical infrastructure vulnerabilities, if you know that your nursing home is not likely to get through a storm, okay, then perhaps you need to think about the plans, or definitely you need to think about the plans for moving people. And um, in this case, there was a decision to, and, and all of those decisions have economic um, implications as well. So a lot of times, as we know, and as perhaps you know here, because you also have hurricanes from time to time, that the prediction can be a little bit unsure until very close to the time that the storm hits. So evacuation decisions for healthcare have to be made early when there's still a lot of uncertainty in that prediction. And so there are costs of staying, there are costs of leaving, there are costs of shutting down a nursing home, costs in terms of dollars and potentially, and, and potentially also the costs in terms of human life. Uh, this nursing home did decide to stay in place, as did quite a number. They lost power after the storm um, due to an issue with transformers. They, they actually had uh, power to their lights, but not power to their air conditioning systems. It became very hot. They stayed in place, and as you might have heard, it was, it's become a big story. Uh, roughly a dozen of their residents ultimately died. Um, some of the findings are coming out from the coroner's office, and the findings are that they died of 
too much heat, of hyperthermia. Uh, and this was because it was apparently extremely hot, became extremely hot over several days. So they took the decision to stay, and it's particularly poignant because there was a working hospital with uh, air conditioning system right next door. So these are really, really important um, questions. They are life and death questions. So that the kinds of issues that we're talking about today don't have easy answers, but the decisions that are made do have important consequences. So it is important to think about them in advance. And um, from everybody I've spoken with who's worked at this facility, uh, they were constantly having issues with the electrical system, the air conditioning, not constantly, but it had frequently happened, old building, uh, not really shored up in a way that they felt even some of the staff uh, felt safe staying there for the storm. And then you had the whole system. You had this nursing home coming to its own defense saying, we called and called and called the electric utility company and begged for help and no, no help came. Well, like you heard, I just got back from Puerto Rico more than two months after Hurricane Maria and there are many healthcare facilities there that still are not on the electrical grid. Um, they're on backup power. So it's not realistic necessarily to think that you're going to get, your institutions will get that electricity back. And there are many reasons, as you know here, from snowstorms to other reasons why that power could fail. So um, this is a scenario from Hurricane Sandy. So you heard John Stewart talk about the storm that hit New York in 2012, I believe it was. And uh, this is a picture just of, uh, you know, sort of reminding me to, to tell you that as the storm was hitting New York City, I was in the command center for a health a hospital system happens to be quite a prepared one or else I don't think they would let a journalist spend the storm with them in their command center. But even so, they had a couple of hospitals that were vulnerable to flooding and I witnessed them pick up the phone as the storm was whipping up and the, the hour of high tide was approaching and they called and they asked the chief medical officers of those hospitals, have you thought about what you might do if not only if the city power fails, but if you get a flood and the backup system fails, as in no power to your hospital. And I was thinking, huh, you're asking them this question now? <laughs> Didn't we have Hurricane Katrina a few years ago? I think this points to the human mind and our sort of inability or the, the really uh, difficulty of forcing ourselves to think about worst case scenarios, right? It's really, really uncomfortable to think about that. But we must think about these scenarios that are, that are sort of the most likely of the unlikely events. It is really incumbent upon us, and whether it's an institution that you may be associated with, like a university or a school, where you know many lives are, many people are, to a hospital, this critical infrastructure that uh, will be so important, not only to the people who are already in it, but in serving people who are uh, affected by a disaster. So very important to think about these things in advance. Now one more scene from Hurricane Sandy, which is, this is Bellevue Hospital, which is our large public hospital in New York City, something like uh, 26 stories, I believe. And as that uh, storm was hitting, Bellevue Hospital, which is located on one of our rivers, the East River, was their basement was starting to fill up with what turned out to be millions of gallons of floodwaters. And the uh, command center, because all of our hospitals have an incident command system when an emergency happens, they called the head of the intensive care unit to the command center. And they said to her, we believe that we could lose all of our power, that our backup power system, that the generators had been raised, unlike you know the John Stewart scenario, so they had moved them up. However, the fuel pumps were low and they were not protected against flooding. You know, we have submarines that go under the water, but you have to protect that electrical infrastructure for it to be able to work. So they thought that we are going to basically run out of power from our backup power once that, uh, you know, the fuel pumps stop working and then you have a little day tank up on the 12th floor and then that's it. So they said, but we have these emergency generators in the administration building that we think we can keep going. And we can jerry-rig some, you know, um, different, uh, you know, extension cords and whatnot. And we think that we can get 
six power outlets to work on your intensive care unit. She had a 56 bed intensive care unit with 50 patients. And you can imagine those of you who've been in a hospital or work in a hospital, what that means. That's patients who are relying on ventilators to breathe. They had patients on heart ventricular assist devices that were keeping their hearts going. They had patients on complicated medical drips that, that kept their blood pressures up. And can you imagine, and I want you to think for a second, of course, none of us can really imagine this, although I have believe there may be a couple people in the audience who work in intensive care units that have lost power, so you could imagine this, but how do you begin to choose which of those patients would get the six generators, the six uh, power outlets? And just try to imagine what kinds of principles you might bring to that decision, and we're gonna come back to this at the end. How would you choose who gets a precious life-saving resource, which groups of patients, which individuals? Um, so let's go to the Katrina example. And we'll, uh, well, before we do, just to point out a couple of principles. So we're talking about the ethics of evacuation and emergency response. And really, I believe that emergencies are a good chance for us to think about ethical issues that are with us all the time. Sometimes really, they're the same ethical issues. Um, talking about the distribution of resources in an emergency is really an extension of like what Aristotle thought about way back when. So we might not settle how the ideal uh, distribution of scarce resources is, uh, is to be done because you know people like Aristotle have been thinking about that for a very long time, not in the medical context. But again, I think these are really important issues for us to think about and to um, you know, have a societal discussion about before the worst occurs. So um, different principles bringing, being brought and the, the philosophical principles of utilitarianism versus egalitarianism. You know, are we looking for some specific outcome or consequence when we think about dividing resources? Or are we aiming more for justice and equitability? And those can sometimes come into conflict. Uh, I think that one of the themes I would like to really emphasize today is that it is a wider discussion. It is sort of the province of all of us to be thinking about these issues because any of us could require medical treatment in an emergency. So these decisions of resource distribution can affect any of us. And again, evacuation decisions, early calls have to often be made. Um, there can be tensions when you're working in emergency between your job duties, um, your personal safety, that can come into play. And um, conflicts between bioethical tenets. So any of you who've taken, I know a lot of students in the audience, you may be taking bioethics classes and learning that there are really four principles that modern medical ethics relies on. Well, in an emergency, they come into conflict frequently. So you have this idea of patient autonomy. The patient gets to choose what kind of treatment he or she wants. But when you're in a limited resource situation, what about justice, the fair distribution of resources? I think you in Canada have a little more experience thinking about this with a nationalized healthcare system that deals with limited resources all the time. Um, and there's a lot of thought into, you know, what kinds of treatments will and will not be provided. And then, of course, finally, there are these issues of social, social disruption, of psychological stress, and that come out of the decisions around evacuations and that must be dealt with in the, the time that follows. So emergencies really, I think, sometimes come down to uh, one particular dilemma, and it was, I think, crystallized by a bioethicist who looked at the Katrina example you're about to hear. And he, he broke it down like this. Is it that crises sometimes make it necessary to break ethical rules? Or is a time of crisis a time that we sort of need our ethical rules and our, our values even more to help keep us on track? And we can, uh, I think you can think about that in different ways. And so again, keep that in the back of your minds as we go through some of these examples. And when we get into the Q&A, it will be interesting to hear different people's perspectives on whether you know, an extenuating circumstance changes ethical principles or kind of reinforces the need for them.
So let's go to New Orleans now. This is Memorial Medical Center, which is a, um, a venerable community hospital, or was in uh, going back to the 1920s. And this is the um, one of many hospitals in New Orleans that Hurricane Katrina struck in 2005. And it was the levee failures after Katrina that ended up with a situation like this, where you can see the hospital is just surrounded by floodwaters. And uh, very early on, there were two vulnerabilities that became uh, very apparent that were relevant and that I think are common to a lot of hospitals around the world. One of them is this issue of backup power and what exactly is it configured to run. So it can be very expensive to have generators that are big enough to keep things like air conditioning systems, cooling systems, heating systems, uh, ventilation systems functioning. And the particular backup power system they had here didn't keep the air conditioning going. And as you can see, the sun came out. It was very hot. It was New Orleans in the south of the United States in August. And so it immediately became hot in this hospital, which is a real threat to patient safety and also makes it very hard to work as a staff member when you're sweating and hot. But this, the hospital did keep going. Um, but there was a second vulnerability that was the real Achilles heel, and that was this question of the power system. So they knew that if the flood waters rose to even about five or six feet, that they could lose the vast majority of power, backup power, to the medical center. And the circuitry, the circuitry was not protected against flooding. So they called for helicopters. Um, helicopters did start to arrive, and this is a helicopter that's on the helipad. But as you can see, this helicopter is small. It could take maybe one or two patients at a time. But at that time, there were about 250 patients in the hospital buildings and 2,000 people. So I wanna, um, I'm gonna throw it to you in, in just a second here. It's that similar question about who do you choose to go first, in this case, in an evacuation, when you know that you could soon lose all power. So just to give you a sense of the patient population, you had neonates, tiny babies, very vulnerable. Um, this is actually a demonstration of something that's very noble that you see a lot in disasters. It's somebody just volunteering to help out. In this case, a nurse's husband, who happened to be in the hospital, who's caring for one of these babies. So you had a whole neonatal intensive care unit. You had also, and this is a picture taken just below the helipad uh, at the top level of the parking garage. And you can see that there are also very sick people who are immobile, who may need to be carried, and they're lying out here. And so you could think of the, this vulnerable population as well in terms of who you would think about moving first. or. You have a whole bunch of people at a hospital usually who might be able to sit up, who might be recovering from surgery, who might be very well near to the ability to be discharged. And so this is a picture of some of them actually sitting on the emergency room ramp, which later became a boat ramp. Boats were able to come up to the top of that ramp and pick people up. Um, or would you think even about the staff itself? So after a disaster, you're really gonna need your medical workers to be able to help with the recovery. Some of them had health problems. Some of them, as you can see here, are not doing very well in the heat. They may have chronic health issues. Then there were a whole bunch of kids there. Uh, one of the principles when you think about preparing for an emergency and you want your staff to show up, uh, such as at a hospital, you gotta think about what can bring them there. So staff were allowed to bring their families to sort of bed down in their offices prior to this storm uh, because this this hospital had always come through all the storms quite well and so this was an incentive bring your family you don't have to go through that long city evacuation process and then wait to come back in all the traffic you can be in a safe place they thought and so there were many kids here and the staff is obviously very worried about them similar principle the pets. So the uh, head of the medical records department was a big pet fan, an animal lover, and so every storm they would convert medical records into a kennel so that people would not have to leave their pets behind. 
uh, at home for an uncertain length of time, they could bring them and have them at the hospital. So suddenly you have all the pets. So I'm going to throw it open to you for some thoughts, and I'm going to repeat for our audience who is uh, watching remotely or after this live event. Uh, if you were somebody in this hospital, either a health worker or an administrator, somebody in charge or just somebody who uh, looks kind of smart and you're, you get asked, who the heck should we put on these evacuations first? We could lose all power at any moment. So who, who gets on the helicopters first? Um, shout out your ideas. You know, which groups would you think you'd want to prioritize? Who has some thoughts? Yes. Great, so she says, anybody who's dependent on ventilators, this is artificial breathing, people who need help breathing, and the reason being that they will only have a certain amount of time to live or to, to have those ventilators work on their battery backups after the electrical system fail. So this is a concept in triage that goes back to the time when triage was first coined by Napoleon's chief surgeon. And he said that um, basically he was looking at a battlefield and this is you know, trying to decide how to organize care. And his concept was, let's give it to the people who need it the most. Uh, let's, in, in that case, it was the most grievously wounded will go first, without regard to rank or distinction, because this was the French concept of egalité. And so that's the concept of triage that that would point to. So you're saying, who needs that resource, electricity, the most? Let's get them out first. Um, does anybody have a different thought about which group you would prioritize? Neonatal babies. The babies, and tell me why. Well, they're so vulnerable. Mm. And um, they also need the care, like the care. So she said they're vulnerable, the babies would be very vulnerable, and they would also need the care because they're intensive care unit babies. Uh, sometimes people add another thought and they, they just say, but, but because they're babies. And <laughs> but really, some ethicists have a concept for this called the fair innings principle. And this is the idea that we all want to live the most innings that possible in life. And babies have had fewer innings. So, um, however, there's, there are ethical arguments on the other side too about, for example, um, this is, sounds horrific, but there are some ethicists who say, well, babies, you know, they haven't been become specialized, or they ha society hasn't invested in them yet, and you you can replace them. Ooh, terrible thought. Um, whereas older people, you know, they've contributed to society and they have value and they have knowledge that could help after a disaster. So, you know, there are different ethical arguments, and and ethicists can can battle amongst themselves over whether age really should be uh, a criterion when you think about rationing in this case or life and death resource distribution but certainly the argument you make about vulnerability I think is a very understandable one other people have other thoughts on this yes whoever has the most need but is also drawing on the most resources and them help but also freeing up resources for the people left behind Ooh, good thinking. So she said, you want to look at those who have the most need, but also the ones who are taking a lot of resources, get them out so that you have more resources to conserve for the people who are left behind. And I think this is a very interesting way of thinking because you're really thinking and, and, and having that kind of sophisticated, detailed thinking is important. And this is sort of why when you have a boilerplate plan, you sometimes realize you got to think about context. And so one of the very important concepts in triage is to really be always evaluating what are the needs, what are the resources I have, and how do I best match them, and uh, constantly reassessing. And so that, that's sort of that fine-tuned thinking that I think is really important in a disaster. And yes, I think you would arguably, if you knew you probably had a limited time to get uh, people out before the power failed, that would be really smart thinking to think, you know, let's, let's get the ones who need the resources most out so we can have more resources for everybody else. Yes, do you have another thought? But how do you know what resources you have? How do you know what resources you have? On a given moment, you think you have X amount of resources, and then two minutes later, you discover after you make these decisions, 
that you don't have those resources. So what he is referring to, so, so he said, you know, the resources could change. Two minutes later, you might discover you don't have the resources that you thought you had, or you might get more resources that you didn't think you had. And so that again points to this idea that you need to be reassessing, that if you're caught in a disaster and you have some important role in that, always be alive to the possibility that the resources will change and can change. And I, I think that's, that's an, an excellent point. Yes, I'll take you. This is a bit dicey, but uh, in a, a situation where you have a limited ability to evacuate people, then making an evaluation of whether the patient that you're evacuating has a reasonable chance of recovery if you evacuate. So this is a very important point. He said, could you also or should you also think about whether the person who needs the resources also is likely to benefit from them. So does that person have a reasonable chance of making it if you do expend the resource of evacuating that person? And, and that's a very reasonable question. And again, this question of, you know, as with the last person, we don't have perfect knowledge, right? It's, it, there's a concept that, you know, disaster nerds, they have acronyms for everything and they have different ways of saying things. And one of them is situational awareness. Awareness, this ability to see in the midst of a very confusing situation. So that, that gets to that. Uh, it, it's sometimes very, very hard to predict which patient will or will not survive in a, in a certain circumstance. But, you know, I think uh, doctors who've been in it for a long time could make a reasonable guess. And what you're getting at is another concept of triage that kind of came after Napoleon's chief surgeon and there was a British surgeon who added another layer to the concept of triage in, in the battlefield. And his concept was that there may be patients who in a particular circumstance would require so many resources to treat, like their wounds might be so grievous, that in that particular con context that you might put them last or at least after other people who were, you know, it was life and death, but it wasn't going to take as many resources to treat them. And so it's sort of a little bit different, but what you're getting at is, you know, how can I use my resources really smartly to try to benefit people who can benefit from them? And again, very, very hard to predict. Those of you who are young or students or who are interested in disaster response, we need more research about outcomes. I don't think we have a very, very good data around you know, the implications of evacuations and choices around who we prioritize or even whether you evacuate in advance of a possible storm versus wait until you lose all power and you have to take people out in, in a more kind of uh, stressful situation. We don't have a lot of data around that. So, um, okay, that's a nice sampling of, of I, I noticed that nobody said the pets. <laughs> and um, there's usually now when I give this talk in the States um, where we really, you know, love our pets, I'm sure you do in Canada too, but there's usually somebody in the audience who says, get those pets out first. And I say, why? And they say, you know, because they're cuter than humans. Or um, they're nicer than humans, but uh, but none of you in the the ethics center here would dare to bring up that argument. Well, so what actually happened in this scenario was that, uh, and there's this whole other question about who makes the decision too, and I think that's one thing we really need to think about, especially if we're developing some protocols, hopefully flexible ones, before a disaster getting societal input on this question because the process by which you make these choices is important because there's no one right answer and we might have all have different feelings about which groups should go first but there are real consequences to those choices so having a, a process that's you know transparent or at least something that you can defend or explain to the public in the moment and after the moment I think is very important. Well, in this case, they were not in a comfortable room like we are. Uh, most of them had never thought about this type of scenario before. It's certainly when I went to med school, we didn't really talk about this. And uh, so they just made the best decisions they could. And I should say going forward that we're not thinking in terms of judging them, but really what can we take from their very unfortunate 
incident that they had to live through, how can we learn from it and go forward in ways that could be helpful in the future? So it was a small group of health professionals, mostly doctors, a few hospital administrators, some nurses who got together and really made this decision on the fly about evacuations. And some of you will be uh, glad to hear they did choose to get the babies out first, the critically ill babies, and the intensive care unit patients. They also, um, here this is a picture of a, uh, a National Guard truck that happened to have been stationed at the hospital before the storm. As the waters were rising, because it, had a, it was a high water truck, they could get a couple of uh, truckloads of people out. And they chose, as you can see, that most of these patients seemed to be able to sit up. But what I was told was a number of them were dialysis patients. And that can really be life and death for somebody, you know, if the power goes out and they can't get dialysis for a number of days, um, you know, th their health could go downhill very quickly. Uh, but they also chose in this early moment a group of patients that would go last. And this is a picture that's taken on the top level of that parking garage just below the helipad. And if you look closely, you can see a, a number, a figure, the number three, written on this gentleman's hospital gown. And so they came up with a number-based triage protocol. So the ones were relatively healthy patients who could move, ambulate. Um, number twos were your typical hospital patient who needed some help or needed to definitely get to another hospital. And the threes were the sickest of the sick and patients who had so-called do not resuscitate orders. So uh, they were going to be put last for evacuation. And I asked some of the doctors when I was, you know, this was a research, many years of research before I wrote the article and then the book. Uh, so I interviewed many people and I asked them, why did you decide to set this category of patients for last? And one of the doctors said, well, I figured somebody who had a do not resuscitate order did not want to um, be saved at the expense of somebody else because they had chosen not to have extraordinary measures to extend their lives. So do not resuscitate means, you know, don't give me CPR, don't try to restart my heart if it stops. In this case, they thought, well, we'll, we'll sort of try to honor that by not um, putting you on a rescue helicopter in front of somebody else. Not necessarily exactly what a DNR is, and we'll get back to that in a second. Another doctor said to me, well, I figured someone with a do not resuscitate order had a terminal or irreversible condition, and therefore, you know, they wouldn't have, quote, as much to lose as other patients if they weren't rescued. And that folks, is a value judgment as much as a medical judgment. And it sort of underlines why it's important for all of us to think about these issues and for those who are in the decision-making role to have a little wider input on this. Because you could imagine scenarios, I mean, number one, not every person with a do not resuscitate order is necessarily at the end of life. That can be the case, but some people do not want CPR for whatever reason, and they can be admitted in a hospital for a surgery and have a DNR and be you know, discharged. Um, and then there are people who may not have much life left, but their daughter might be getting married next month. And so there can be all sorts of you know, reasons around that. And certainly you, you will have the response like you heard from Halifax, the Halifax explosion 100 years ago, where some people do say, you know, take that other person before me. But sometimes people really do have a will to live. And again, not with judging these folks, but just coming out of this, a very venerable institution in, in the United States uh, that's now called the National Academy of Medicine had a group come together and look at some of the aspects, a group of experts look at the aspects around this particular case. And they came out and they said, you know, in the future, it's probably not a good idea. It is not a good idea to use end of life preferences as a triage criterion for a number of reasons. Number one, it might not correlate with what you think it does. And number two, it's hard enough to get people to think of end of life preferences in the best of times. So if they think that um, putting a do not resuscitate order on their chart will be interpreted as a do not rescue, then they'll be even less likely. And in fact, that's sort of what happened because in this case, suddenly, you know, somebody is noticing that my mom, who is one of the sickest people on floor eight, 
is not being moved toward the exits, and everybody else is. And why is that? And then the you know information trickles out because it's very hard to come and tell somebody you know you're not going to get this resource that we have, i.e., the helicopters. Um, information trickles out. Well, you know your mom has a do not resuscitate, and those patients are going to be moved last. Well, take that DNR off of my mom's chart. That actually happened here, and you know daughters were begging for their mothers, and in some cases the do not resuscitate orders were removed, and in other cases they were not. So this really came up, and th these these questions of these ethics around evacuation uh, order um, really had you know practical implications in in the midst of this disaster. So Monday morning the storm hits. Tuesday morning the waters rise, like you saw. Wednesday morning. All power fails. The, the horrible scenario. They had gotten out the ICU patients, they had gotten out the babies with the helicopters before that happened, but they had all of the sickest patients still at the hospital. Plus, I didn't tell you, but there was a separately owned long-term acute care unit on the seventh floor of a hospital that now had no working elevators. And because they were separately owned and they were really sick patients, but they weren't even considered in this original triage protocol because the original thought was, well, you know, they're under separate ownership. They'll, they'll deal with their own evacuation. Well, same helipad. Um, so you had 55 very complex, medically complex, long-term acute care patients that were in this situation at that point with no power, in a hospital, no working elevators, and these were patients who were on ventilators and other very important life support devices. So this created a catastrophe. And the helicopters also stopped coming regularly because they had a whole city to triage. There were people waving rags off of rooftops. We have many people who live at home now successfully with chronic illnesses and the city wasn't fully evacuated. So you can imagine you're a Coast Guard flyer and you're trying to decide, do I go to a hospital which should have staff, medicine, food, they're supposed to be able to shelter in place for a certain amount of time, or do I go to a house where somebody's on a rooftop might not have even water? So this was going on. But meanwhile, communications were failing, their cell phones weren't working in most cases, and so the staff here is just thinking, oh my gosh, how can we take care of patients? You know, sometimes we in these advanced medical systems that have become, we've become so reliant on power that uh, I think our, our strengths, our technological advances can become weaknesses in an emergency because we are so dependent in our health systems on electronic records, on all of these technologies, and it can be very, very difficult just even psychologically as somebody who is so used to saving lives to suddenly lose all of those tools that you're used to. It can be very, very emotionally difficult, and that was certainly the case here. And um, then there was a second dilemma that arose that I want to throw to you for a few seconds here. And that was that patients did start to die in the heat. They had been moved to these different sites for evacuation, collected in certain areas, and suddenly the helicopters weren't coming. So they were spending hours and hours in the heat. They were no longer in the units where the staff knew them, um, and they were some of them were dying. And the staff was becoming very desperate, and they were hearing gunshots go off in the neighborhood, and there were fears about what was happening. Some people feared for their own lives, their children's lives. And, of course, I mentioned the pets. There were, of course, at, at, you know, the boats were starting to come, non-essential staff were allowed to leave, and people were thinking about their pets as well, the staff, and saying, uh, they actually said, well, we're not even allowed to bring so much as a suitcase on a boat because you want to pack as many humans as you can. Uh, they weren't being allowed to bring their pets. And so some of them started to ask the doctors to euthanize their pets because they were afraid if we left them behind, they might be there for days and not have food, etc. So they thought this is the most merciful thing. Well, just now, none of us can really imagine ever what it would have been like to be there. But if you take a moment and try to imagine as best as you can the scene, and somebody walks up to you and she says, you know, we're talking about these pets. What about some of these suffering patients? 
shouldn't we be thinking about putting some of them out of their misery? And I just want to throw it back to you. You're a doctor, you're a nurse, you're an administrator. You hear this kind of talk going around, you know, how can we save all these people? We got to get out of here for our own safety. People are dying. What chance do we really have to get them out? Should we be helping some of them die? What do you guys think? This was, you know, actually the discussion that was starting to happen. Yeah. Should we talk? Okay, so she's saying, just for those of you who can't hear, can you uh, involve the patients in this conversation? Were all the patients not able to talk, or could you involve them, or even their family members? If they themselves weren't conscious or able to verbalize, could you involve their family members in that? This question, even of something like assisted suicide, is very, very sensitive in the medical profession because it goes back to the time of Hippocrates. Apparently, in, in my research for the book, I learned that at one point in history, doctors and sorcerers were kind of the same thing. And so you'd have a potion and it could either help to promote life or it could you know, hasten somebody's death who you wanted to get rid of. But at the time of Hippocrates, there was this real division in the concept of a physician as somebody who promotes life. So even the idea of um, being able to prescribe a drug that somebody could take who's you know, very chronically ill and, and might choose to commit suicide and um, you know, not have to suffer, that's very, very controversial, even you know, that step in medicine, let alone the idea of euthanasia, of, of a doctor, him or herself, um, you know, promoting patient death, but always, 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 with pretty much without exception, where that is legal, it involves a very complex uh, co um, consent pro procedure. So what you're saying is, you know, in this case, is there a way to consent people around this? And um, I can tell you that in my research in this particular scenario, that wasn't attempted, and that there were family members uh, available for some of those patients that weren't weren't actually consulted, um, and many of the patients were not conscious. Yeah. Did you have one? No. Oh. <laughs> yes, you do. Um, in that case, are they not making a, they're making a decision for something that's knowable, which is if I put this patient, if I euthanize a patient, they will be put out of their suffering. But they, but they didn't know what the future held. They were trying to imagine what was going to transpire in the future and whether there was a hope of evacuating that patient. So, so I think um, this commenter is saying uh, there's a, something known. If you give an injection, you know that that patient will die and that the other arm of that decision is sort of an unknown. So, and I think this is an important point and it gets to one ethicist who looked at this case said that if you were ever in a situation where you knew that you had two choices, one is hasten patients' deaths and the other is abandon them. Those are the two no-nos in medicine. You don't kill people and you don't walk away from them if they need you. If you were ever in a situation where those were literally your two choices, like you're, you're being bombarded and bombs are following and you, know, you, you have literally those two choices, that you could be, I think, and those of you who are ethicists can know the difference between something that's excusable and justifiable. I think he said you could excuse either choice. Um, and I think just having interviewed people, there were some people who literally felt that that was their situation, that they themselves had to get out. There was some talk of a curfew in martial law, and uh, it, you know, people had a concept that they, they really did need to get out. And so I, there may have been some folks who thought that that was the choice. However, it, it wasn't actually. And there were a number of staff who told me I was not that freaked out. Some of my colleagues were, but I kind of knew, you know, we're, it, we're, it's an eight-story building. We can step up. We're not going to drown. Um, you know, we will stay as long as it needs, as the patients need us. 
but um, but it is a good a point well taken. Let's get one or two more thoughts on this scenario. You know, your colleague walks up to you and says, "Let's put some of these patients out of their misery." Any other thoughts about that? How you might respond? Yes. So her question is, are the patients going to die through the evacuation process anyway? And I think this is um, not knowable, right? But there are some folks in the hospital who said that they really felt that that might be the case, that the patient who you might move um, would probably die. They're, they're so fragile that if you move them and try to helicopter them and get them up to the helipad that they could die in the process. They'd have a very good chance of dying in the process. And um, it, it's interesting because right here in Halifax there's a group that's working very hard on thinking about how do you evacuate an intensive care unit in whatever kind of emergency. It's real interesting because there are very few places that have actually thought about this, but it's a really important thing to think about. About. And one of that, the questions that they're um, you know, looking at is, are there patients who you literally can't evacuate and, um, or shouldn't, perhaps? Now, there is another option, though, and that is to stay with people, to accompany them, to keep them comfortable until they pass naturally or until you can get you know, a generator working or whatnot. And so that was an option here. And... Um, it, you know, you wouldn't necessarily have to move everybody, but it, it is a very good point. Uh, take one more thought. Yes, sir. Um, doesn't this happen all the time where you have suffering patient or prognosis who wants to live? So if you start euthanizing here, then what about all the other cases where resources are there, but the patient suffering, prognosis or they want to live? They want to live, you're saying. Yeah, so he said, um, doesn't this remind you of real life where you have people who, who are, uh, you know, don't have a very good prognosis and they're suffering and they want to live? Or you could say that there are cases where people want to die in that, in that circumstance. And this gets back to something I said at the start, which is that an emergency, a disaster like this, can really focus our minds on questions that are with us all the time. And some of the people who I interviewed, and we'll go right to the next slide actually, thank you for the opportunity to talk about that. This is one of the very, very long time doctors at this hospital. He was head of the critical care unit, then he became an administrator, and he was there for this scenario, and he said, boy, this stuff happens all the time in the intensive care unit. It really wasn't that different. And there are people toward the end of life and, you know, we kind of up the morphine. And so, you know, I thought that that was the right thing to do here. And I said to him, was it really the same? And he said, well, it was a little bit different because, you know, we didn't get to really talk to them about it and they weren't actually necessarily in pain. So we weren't actually giving them the medicine for for the pain, but but otherwise it was kind of similar. And then I talked to ethics experts and I talked to palliative care experts, the people who are really the people who are focusing a lot on advancing this idea of how to help people live better um, when they may have a terminal uh, diagnosis and may have a lot of pain to contend with or other types of suffering. And they will tell you there's a bright line there. And in fact, that, you know, this goes back to St. Thomas Aquinas and the, the concept of the double effect, that you can give the same medicines that might kill a person, but you can give them to provide comfort if you do it in a, in a way that is aimed toward, you know, really addressing the suffering and doing that in a proportional way. And yes, if there's a risk that that might, you know, possibly cause death in some people, yes, but you're doing it with the intention of addressing the suffering. And so, um, so they will argue that, th that these are very different things, that trying to give drugs to hasten death versus give drugs for alleviating suffering, are, are, that there's a bright line there. So there's a lot of debate, I think, that, that could be brought into this in a normal time, and here we are in an emergency. Well, what actually happened here, so Dr. Cook, uh, this 
person here, he uh, very bravely spoke very, very honestly to me about the scenario and why he made the choice he did. And he had a particular patient on the eighth floor, which was intensive care, but had a DNR and she was had advanced cancer. He thought her prognosis wasn't good. And he walked all the way up to the top story in the heat. And he himself had recently had two heart attacks, knew he didn't think he could make it back up there again, saw this one patient left, thought it would be very hard to move her. She was very full of fluid from her disease process. And he turned to a nurse and said, you know, can you give her enough morphine till she goes? She was already on a certain dose of morphine. And the nurse dutifully charted upping the morphine dosage. I don't remember if it was 10 times or 100 times, but a large increase in the morphine, dose, morphine dosage, and she died very shortly after that. And he, Dr. Cook, thought that this was the right thing. And he then counseled other doctors to do the same for other patients. Then you had, so, you know, we'd, we might not all think about how we would answer that question in this comfortable room, even in the moment in that disaster, there, were, there was a real difference in opinion. This doctor, Dr. Bryant King, who was one of the youngest doctors, who was an, uh, an internist who worked as a hospitalist in the hospital, he heard the rumblings about, you know, should we put patients out of their misery? And he said, what are you talking about? Yes, we're, we're all suffering, but, you know, we're going to get out of here. Eventually, the rescue is going to come. In the meantime, we have the means. We have a pharmacy. The pharmacy was writing out, having doctors write prescriptions on scraps of paper. But, you know, we can keep people as comfortable as possible. And we don't cross that line. That's not a doctor's job to decide who lives and who dies. And he absolutely refused to participate when he perceived that this was happening. And he, he actually chose to leave. He was later criticized for leaving. Many people were leaving at that point. There were just a few of these critical patients left. And so he felt that this was absolutely the wrong choice. Um, the next picture is a kind of a disturbing one. This is um, a picture of the, the morgue, the, sorry, the hospital chapel, which had been turned into a morgue. So this was the scene that the disaster mortuary teams found when they arrived several days later. And there were more patients who had died at this hospital than in any of the other hospitals in New Orleans that had similarly been flooded, had lost power, had waited days for rescue. So why had so many patients died here? An investigation was launched, and ultimately it was found that about two dozen patients had on that Thursday, September 1st, 2005. So again, storm hits Monday, water rise Tuesday, Wednesday, Day, all the power goes out one day later that's how quickly things became so desperate that uh, around two dozen patients had been injected with morphine or versed or a combination versed being a fast-acting sedative and died in a very short time period on that Thursday and uh, so an investigation was launched the toxicology was done and they were not all patients that were teetering on the edge of life. And this is important when we talk about that slippery slope argument about if you cross a line, where does it go? You had that patient who Dr. Cook worked with, who you know was very close to death by his estimation. But then you had someone named uh, Emmett Everett, who's in this picture here. He was a 61-year-old, if I remember correctly, a doting grandfather. He had had a very unfortunate spinal cord stroke, which is a rare thing, but it left him paralyzed, unable to walk. And as you can see in the picture, he was very heavy. We have a lot of people in our societies who are heavy. Well, he happened to be on the seventh floor of this hospital with no elevators, and uh, he had multiple medical issues. And when there was a discussion about him, and I interviewed people who were involved in it, they said, I couldn't figure out how we would get him out. He was on the seventh floor, we'd have to take him all the way down, then up to the helipad, then would a helicopter even take a man of his size? And I think it points to the fact that you can be working in a disaster and you become so tired and it's very, very hard to think 
outside the box in that creative way that we talked about at the start when you're under that kind of pressure and you know sleep deprivation they literally couldn't imagine how to save him even though we can probably think of lots of ways that that could have been accomplished and indeed men of his size were saved at other facilities other hospitals he was awake that morning he was alert he had fed himself breakfast. He had asked his nurses, are we ready to rock and roll? He had told one of them in particular who never forgot it, don't let them leave me behind. So he had expressed, somebody asked about, could you ask the patients? He had expressed that desire to be rescued. And yet he was one of these patients found with this drug combination in his body uh, after the storm. And so this particular case has, has really haunted a lot of people who were involved in investigating this. And this is his family, and I spoke with all of the families I could find, and with one exception, they all felt that some more efforts should have been made to get their, patients, their loved ones out and not to, you know, because there were people who said, well, these families should be grateful because their loved ones were given a comfortable way out and did not suffer. And by the vast majority, all but one, felt, no, you, you should have done more to, to try to save them. My loved one, his life mattered. Even if it wasn't as long of a life or it was a disabled life, his life definitely mattered. So there was this investigation, and then the attorney general, he's here at the podium, and he's raising two fingers and saying, these two drugs are a deadly combination. If any of you are doctors here, you know that those two drugs can be given together in the proper way, not necessarily cause death. But he said, you know, these were, this was murder. And he arrested a doctor and two nurses, accused them of second-degree murder. They've always insisted that they were innocent. And again, it all hinges on intent, right? The legality and the ethics. Were they given the drugs to keep them comfortable or were they given the drugs to hasten their deaths? Uh, the two doctors who I interviewed who participated in the injections told me that they, they, for their part, had intended to hasten death and they explained why. Um, the, the people who were arrested have always maintained their innocence and it's important to point that out. So here's the coroner, he's throwing up his hands and uh, I think he was being interviewed on some other topic but I think it's a good picture. He said, I couldn't figure out what to call these. If I called them homicides, that would look horrible for our city, which had already suffered so much. But uh, a, a, a second-degree murder case, as first degree as well, has to go to a grand jury. And so he was very torn about what to tell this grand jury that he thought about the cause of death. Ultimately, the prosecutors in this case, the local district attorney and assistant district attorney, they were also very, very conflicted about this. And it gets back to that question we started with, which is, what an extreme circumstance. Do we really want, you know, you think of all the layers of failure here, the levies that the government built, um, the, the, you know, the government response to Katrina, which was very flawed and very slow, uh, the hospital corporation, this was a for-profit hospital chain that didn't think about sending their own helicopters till a couple days into this when they realized that the, you know, government resources weren't quite enough. So shouldn't they have some of the responsibility here? So should it really rest on these individuals who made this fateful decision, apparently, uh, to, to inject these drugs? And this was very controversial in New Orleans and certainly a very, became very unpopular choice to arrest these women. Uh, of course, they didn't know, the population didn't know what had actually happened. This has only come out years later with a lot of research. They just assumed that people who stayed, who were health professionals with great records, would not have intentionally done something to cause harm. And so uh, this assistant district attorney over there said to me, I felt like I was trying to apply law to a war zone. Now, actually we do have laws in wartime, and this is important. These situations are important because Yes, the G Geneva Conventions would be one example. Somebody said, really? <laughs> um, and so I think it is important that these kinds of dilemmas come up with every disaster, and we really have to think about whether we want to make exceptions to our laws or to our ethical standards um, you know, because of extenuating circumstances. And so I, I just want to end with some positive examples of 
just about life-saving, even in this situation, even in this horrific, terrible example of, of something gone very wrong. But even in that case, creativity and individual sort of uh, efforts save lives. And this is just a picture of helicopters arriving. They don't have the right equipment for the neonates, those NICU babies, but uh, somehow the doctors and the nurses decide we can stick the babies under our scrub shirts and hand ventilate them uh, and they put them on the helicopters and they saved all of the baby's lives. And um, there was also creativity in terms of the route of evacuation. They found a um, a hole in the machine room wall that they could pass patients through and it would be a real shortcut to get them into that garage where they then put them on the back of pickup trucks, drove them up to the top floor of this parking garage and this is the most amazing photo. They actually carried patients up the rickety flights of steps to the top of the helipad, a helipad that had not been used since Pope John Paul visited New Orleans many years prior. It was a, not a, a helicopter pad that they used. However, they had invested in some level of preparedness. They had shored it up so it wouldn't fall down and it served them very well in this disaster. So preparedness investments can make a big difference. So uh, creative thinking d did save lives even in that scenario. So I'm going to end with the scenario at Bellevue Hospital in New York City and you see these uh, this tangle of electric extension cords and that dilemma you remember the, the intensive care unit head who's told you we're going to get you six power outlets in your ICU who doctor let us know let us have a list so she knew the Katrina example and she said, you know what, this is not a decision for one person, I'm going to get a team together, and this is not a decision where anybody who has a patient on the ICU should be involved because their ethical duty would be to advocate for their individual patient. So she pulled together a team of people, they looked at the situation, they applied a, something called a SOFA score, which is a sort of a score for uh, intensive care unit patients that gave her a little bit of a sense of which patients might benefit the most from those resources uh, and need them the most. Not validated, probably not, but it's something objective she felt that they could make that decision on because when you bring in other kinds of you know, uh, considerations, you might get into things like social value and things like that, that can be very subjective. So she wanted something kind of objective. And then um, also they didn't give up hope, so they thought, if we are going to have patients who are on ventilators who aren't going to get a power outlet, we're going to station a nurse or a respiratory therapist at every bedside ready to hand ventilate the patient as long as possible uh, if the power fails. So they weren't going to give up on anybody. And so then they, they moved the patients around. She had the presence of mind to think about what will people tomorrow think? You know, we always talk about in the U.S. Monday morning quarterbacking, looking back and, you know, it's very easy to judge. She was able to judge in advance, to think. She actually told me we have these tabloid, um, a lot of tabloids in New York City, and she thought about what rhymes with my last name because if a lot of people die that's going to be the headline tomorrow um, so she was thinking about you know what will I be able to do here that I'll be able to defend tomorrow very very forward thinking and so they came up with a list of patients they moved them from the bedsides all this within an hour but what's ended up saving lives in this scenario was not the rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic, but it was actually somebody who thought even more creatively. Remember I told you that the power was going to fail because of those fuel pumps that were very vulnerable in the basement that was filling with water. Somebody, and I still have never heard who it was, had this idea, well, what if we form a human chain up the staircases to the 12th floor where those backup generators are and we literally pass the fuel up and we, we fuel them by hand. So we're no longer relying on those pumps. And that's exactly what they did at Bellevue Hospital. And you could smell the smell of diesel in the stairwells. And it started out with just regular volunteers, any, any of us passing those diesel, you know, jerry cans of diesel up and then the National Guard took over and I believe it took almost as much time to evacuate Bellevue Hospital even though the waters receded but it's such a huge hospital as it did the Katrina hospitals, uh, the ones in New Orleans after Katrina. They ended up being able to get people out and maintain the partial power all the way. 
One of the last two patients was a very heavy patient. I believe he was heavier than Emmett Everett, who you saw. And they kept passing those fuel tanks or the, the fuel jerry cans up until they could figure out how to get one elevator running and they got him out. So some lessons had been, had been learned. <coughs> and this is a picture from one of the stairwells taking the patients out. So, <coughs> pardon me. It's this brisk weather we're having. <laughs> um, so this is uh, that ethicist I mentioned. This is his conclusion, uh, his answer to that question we asked at the very start, which is he, he came down on the side of favoring having these ethical um, principles and holding ourselves to them even in an extreme situation. And uh, of course having compassion for people who are pushed to, to have to make these impossible decisions. But he felt, you know, even if it's looking at somebody and you, you want to end their misery because you're, you're a compassionate person and you're miserable looking at them, um, maybe we have these principles in place to prevent us from crossing that line even for compassionate reasons. So in summary, my big take on points, prepare, but prepare to be flexible. Share the burden of decision making and think about tomorrow. And you can think in your own context because this is a hospital we've been talking about, but really these principles apply and I want you to all go home and think about what are the most likely emergencies that might affect my workplace, my home, my community, who are the vulnerable people, what are the kinds of things that I could invest in to prepare. And if you do that, I think it will be a contribution to your ability to get through things. This is a very wordy slide, but it gets at some specific recommendations. And um, I think, again, that evacuation decisions have to often be made early without perfect information. That the triage and the sort of idea about the ethics of evacuation really should be a wider discussion that involves a lot of values. Um, that if we have infrastructure vulnerabilities, we should either be investing in protecting that infrastructure or facing that reality, which is so hard to face, but how do we prepare for the fact that our infrastructure isn't perfect and that it may cost a lot to improve on it. So then what are what is the plan for when that infrastructure fails? Um, trying to maintain standards rather than low them, lower them or immediately jump to this idea that we can't, um, that, that there's nothing we can do. And in fact, sometimes, again, those resources will come. Um, the critical need for all of you young people to do research on disasters so that we have better information and can make better investments in preparing. And then drilling and planning. You don't want to show up on game day without having practiced. And it's really not all about having one particular preparedness project and then putting it on a shelf and never thinking about it again because then you will really not have it at your fingertips. So this is how you can get in touch and I look forward to a bit of question and answer and it's, um, it's been delightful to be here. So thank you. Great. Okay, thanks so much, uh, Sherry, what a great, uh, what a great talk. Um, so we will now take questions from the audience and from those watching online. Uh, thank you. Please keep your questions brief so that we can take as many as possible. Uh, please come to the microphone wherever that <laughs> might be being set up right now, which is great because I think that's what I get to get a question in. Um, those watching from the live stream can ask questions by typing into the chat screen, emailing their questions <coughs> to info at sesepa.ca, which is info at ccepa.ca or tweeting at, at public ethics CA. Um, so we're just, as we just set our microphone up, um, I'm gonna take the opportunity to ask a question. Great. To get started. Um, so one, I mean, there, there are a few I'd love to ask, so I'm gonna hold them in reserve for the reception afterwards, but uh, um, one question that has always fascinated me about your book, I, I think it's such a rich account uh, of this incredibly complex situation, and uh, at uh, dinner earlier tonight, uh, one of the guests mentioned uh, just how detailed it is, how you really place the reader in this incredible situation. From a researcher's standpoint, though, 
I'm just amazed because there are so many people involved and there are times when you refer to silences, a sense that people didn't really know what the orders were. Mm. And so I guess I'm wondering from a research standpoint, how did you reconstruct this environment when you weren't there you're pulling together all of these opinions and they don't all agree right. about what happened. And you've got to, in an age when we're trying to think about facts, and we talked a little about that at dinner too, you know, what are the facts? Um, how did you construct this reality? Um, I guess, I'm thinking from a research standpoint, how did you do it? Well, that, and that really was the goal because it, it really, you know, when you think about a hospital and how big hospitals can be, and this one was like the equivalent of two city blocks, and you think about wherever you are in that facility, you're going to have a different experience of things. If you're on the helipad and the helicopters are coming, you're kind of getting information from them about what's happening in the city. But if you're way deep in the hospital with patients and, you know, you think that there's a meeting twice a day to give an update, but you get the time wrong and you're, you're really operating with very little information. So I realized very quickly that the experience of being in that place really varied from person to person and everybody had a different perspective. So that it seemed to be important to try to somehow include that. And I also didn't want us to, or the reader to just read and judge. I wanted them as much as possible to march through chronologically with the same lack of information that somebody who was in the scenario would have had. So, you know, this limited view and you're kind of like walking through it as it's happening as much as possible and trying to imagine what would I do or so that that was a goal and you're absolutely right it it wasn't um, it, it required a lot of research and I have a background as a researcher so that part I really love. In fact, sometimes it's easier to just keep researching and researching and never sitting down and writing, <laughs> which might have been why it took years to write the book. But um, so the way I think about it is really like any researcher would. Um, it's a bit different, obviously, in different disciplines. And those of you in social sciences, you have your methodology and same in the basic sciences. But in this case, it was trying to triangulate a lot of information. So I, I really had a lot of empathy when I was writing the the, about the person who was doing the um, research for the attorney general's office and she was trying to figure out what the heck had happened and she just had a lot of imperfect information so she had like subpoena power and she could haul people in for interviews but she couldn't necessarily make them comply in important ways and um, it was just a lot of information to, to put together so it was everything for me from interviews court records there was a lot of civil litigation so this hospital was sued for in essence failing to prepare for something that was foreseeable um, and you know a lot of things got entered into the, the court record emails uh, that were written at the time before the power failed of course uh, that really helped to give like a TikTok that you could rebuild and then just um, you know whatever documents I could find whatever interviews and then putting that all together and trying to uh, tell it in a way that wouldn't be completely confusing. Did you have a magical software that helped with this? Or really <laughs> <laughs> no, the magical software was like a, a bulletin board and it was like cutting pieces of paper like an art project and putting them up and then rearranging them. And one of the principles for those of you who might be writers or who enjoy writing that you learn when you take writing classes is like it's very helpful to think in terms when if you're trying to not confuse your reader you want to keep some things constant so time chronology is a really powerful through line we can all relate to the passing of time so if you're gonna switch from like you know the helipad to the emergency room ramp at least keep it chronological or if you're gonna switch uh, from person to person then at least uh, keep them in the same spot so trying to keep some of those orienting things present and so that was kind of like a puzzle with these pieces I knew the key incidents and thinking about which perspective can I tell this incident through and then how to weave that in sort of and and really putting it out it, it to me that works better than some computer program although I'm sure that there probably is one no, no, that could I'm, do it more efficiently uh, please go ahead Hi. Um, I have two two questions I think 
by thinking about how it seems, I mean, these situations affect everybody, but it seems like the people who are making the decisions are very separate from the people who are being affected by those decisions. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes the people who make those decisions are sitting in an office, they have the money to escape from these situations, they're not gonna die. And how do you work on balancing those power dynamics and having the people who are most vulnerable to the results of these decisions getting a say in that? Or if there's some sort of consultative reflection process that happens afterwards, and I'm particularly interested in it in the context of New Orleans, given the racial dynamics in the city, and that, you know, I'm pretty sure a lot of the people making the decisions were white, and a lot, many of the most vulnerable folks in that community are not white. And then my second question, I guess, when we were talking about learning, I mean, even from, from my experience from traveling, there's a lot of situations around the world that have to deal with these, these resource questions every day, mm. not just within disasters, but I mean, hospitals in West Africa and all over the world, and I'm interested in, is, is are there processes of learning where we look at different instances across the world and, and other places in the world are affected by natural disasters at a much higher rate than we are in North America, and how can we learn from people who have been literally making these decisions every day their entire medical career? So these are excellent questions, and I guess I don't have to repeat them. Is that right? They're, it's captured on the audio? Okay, terrific, because I wouldn't be able to put it so well. So I, I think that almost in, in combining your two questions, I'm thinking of one example that uh, when you think about inclusivity in uh, preparedness plans and in triage plans and then also thinking about where can we have learning from. So one group who you might think are the most vulnerable would be people with physical disabilities, for example, and uh, often left out of the planning process to the real detriment of, um, of different you know, cities that have done that. In fact, there have been even lawsuits, for example, in my city, New York City, there have been lawsuits about failure to plan around people with physical disabilities for disasters. And there is so much to learn from people who live with physical disabilities and have to, um, I mean, they have also so much adaptive capabilities that a lot of us don't who are uh, able-bodied or temporarily able-bodied as as some people say so so that would be one example of kind of highlighting the importance of not only including different groups who may be very impacted by uh, you know a disaster or an emergency in that planning process getting their perspectives but also they may have some really good ideas so that's kind of a combination of the two of those and I think you know as much as a question you asked you're also really making a statement and I think I would agree with you on on both of those things that we need to learn from other places and in in five days at memorial or in in the process of researching it and I think in you know you'll see woven through the book there are um, if, for example, I went to South Africa where they literally are rationing dialysis in the public health care sector. I was just back there, actually. Uh, the research that I did was in 2010, and sadly in 2017, they're still really, really, it's um, literally people who would be very good candidates for dialysis are being turned away at a high, high percentage. They're taking a real minority of people who have kidney failure onto dialysis. And it's heartbreaking. And there is a committee that sits down in Cape Town every week at the main, at one of the two main public hospitals, actually, two different committees, one at each. And they go through the list of patients and they decide who lives and who dies. And so I went there to find out, well, how the heck do you do that? They had recently gone through a process where the health professional said, you're asking us, you, the state, by deciding not to fully fund uh, dialysis for everybody, as, as at least in our health system in the U.S., that is the one condition that we have universal health care for, because we didn't want to ration that. And we, when we started to, when dialysis first came out, uh, there was a big public backlash against that rationing. So there, they, the doctor said they had done it for years, and they were sort of being an arm of the state, and they said, now we want to step back and say, we want a fair process for this. We're looking at our outcomes, and there's a lot of discrimination in our outcomes. And so they brought in ethicists, they brought in members of the general public to have a conversation. Again, it's 
answering both of your questions. How do you involve the public and inform, in informing some of these protocols and these thinking about preparedness and also learn from other places? So, there, so the big takeaway from that is a concept called procedural justice. So we may all have different ideas about which group should be prioritized, but what we think, I think we can all agree on is that process by which that decision is made should be as just as possible, as, transpar as transparent as possible. And that's kind of my big takeaway after looking at these issues over, over the many years is that that's what I really come away believing is, is valuable. I'm mindful of time. I'll ask this gentleman if you've got one quick question, sir, and then, uh, and then we'll bring it to a close. Yeah, it's, it strikes me that the we're at the end of the line at the real ethical decisions in terms of, we talk about resources as if somebody's de decreed this is the amount of resources you have, but I don't think the armed forces in Russia or United States or Israel would say, okay, you're only allowed two nuclear warheads. Plan with that. But so there's a choice as to how much is made and, and the same thing in terms of the hospital. If we have a healthcare system that's a house of cards, it's not it's impossible to organize for a, a crisis if it doesn't function on the sunny days, the best days. And I think, secondly, I think if you wanted to learn in terms of how they've got this evacuation down, it's not very far. Just go to Cuba. In the last hurricane, they evacuated one million citizens. They just went down and moved out of the main area, and they had places for them to stay and be fed and be watered. and the very first day of the storm, they offered 700 healthcare workers and linesmen to Puerto Rico, and Puerto Rico wouldn't let them in. And so, I think Cuba would be an excellent example that if you wanted to see how they how they do it, and they make a point of spending money and educating their kids about hurricanes and so forth. That would be, a, and that's a poor country, so it's not a matter of resources. It would be a, it would be easy with the amount of money the Americans have. Thanks. me is this idea that we have a societal triage so it's not just triage at the point of the emergency with the patients it's also this question of how much we invest in preparing for rare but potentially catastrophic events and that is a form of triage in and of itself because we have daily priorities and only when we think about the the consequences of not being prepared and we see some real examples of that um, in in recent months and also you know over time in this Katrina example only when we are aware of those consequences can we really decide and have an informed discussion about what we invest in preparing for these emergencies and certainly having witnessed a lot of the the awful results of the lack of preparedness I, you know I I believe that that's a really important um, discussion to have and to be investing in improving our preparedness so that's a great way to end this this session it's been such a delight to spend time with you here and um, to understand a lot of the work that's going on locally on these issues and um, so I wish you uh, you know I give you an encouragement to continue on that path and thank you very much